All righty. Uh, here in 1 Samuel chapter 27, we have David here. And um, the title of my message this evening is When the Pressure is On. When the Pressure is On. Uh, here we're going to start out looking at the life of David. And we know the life of David, he spent a great deal of time in his younger years prior to him becoming king. He just spent a great deal of time just on the run, on the run for his life. There were people that was haunting his life and looking to take his life away from him. And with this title, you can pretty much uh, substitute that word pressure with uh, different terms such as uh, stress or being distressed. Uh, as well. So it's not just when the pressure is on, but in general, we're talking about being stressed out and when, you know, people are just at their wits end. And today we're going to look at a, a great deal of people. And I'm just scratching the surface of this topic, but I'm sure you can probably think of some other people when we go through this who were stressed out and who had situations of just pressure and stress and where they're just uh, overwhelmed. And we're going to look at uh, for one, just David, we're going to start with him <clears throat> and the fact that David is stressed out. Look at verse one. This is the main text of our lesson today. It says, and David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. So what we see here is David is pretty much at a point where he has taken all that he can take. He said, there is nothing better for me than I should escape speedily, that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. So the question is, what has gotten David to this point? What has gotten to David to this point where he says, you know what? I'm not going to live in Israel anymore. I'm going to move to the land of the Philistines. And not only that, uh, we see later on in verse 7 in the same chapter that David just didn't go there for a few days. It said in verse 7 that he was there for a full year and four months. That's almost a year and a half uh, that he just spent his time in the land of the Philistines. So first of all, let's go back and look at what began this pressure. What began this stress of David for David? Because, you know, people doesn't just, they don't just get stressed overnight. There's usually a buildup to a point where people just say, I'm stressed out. I can't take this anymore. So for one, let's look at David's buildup. Let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 and let's work our way up. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 10. We know for one, what kicks it off for David is when he has this victory over Goliath, right? And it's all good. Saul doesn't have a problem. He's actually rejoicing over the fact that David has this victory, right? But what turned Saul, what gave him that evil eye? It was that song, right? That song that the women came up with. Saul kills his thousands, right? But David his tens of thousands. And the Bible said that basically his issue was that they prescribed David tens of thousands, right? So he just have a problem with that, hey, why he get more thousands? Come on, Saul, did he really kill 10,000 people, you know? So he's just taking this thing literal and he's just, you know, that's all he can do is zone in. And this basically kicks it off for David, the fact that he gets this victory. And then guess what? It's this pressure that comes uh, for him. And the thing is, is, that's how it usually goes. That after you have a, a great victory, after something great happens for you, after you do a great work for the Lord, just know that there's going to be some battles that come after that. Just know that there's going to come some stressful times and some attacks that will try to come. We're going to see that later on with someone else. But in chapter 18, let's look at chapter 18 and we'll see in verse 10, notice this. We're talking about the buildup of chapter 27, where David just saying, you know, there's nothing else for me. There's nothing better else for me. That's, I can, that's all I can take. Verse 10 in chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 10, the Bible says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast a javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So we see this is the buildup of it, right? Saul, because his disobedience, the Lord is allowing this evil spirit to come upon him and it's troubling him. So they figure, well, way to get this evil spirit to, you know, 
know, be soothed or come down off Saul is to get somebody to play some music for him, right? And what do they get? Well, they get a young man named, uh, uh, named David, and he's there to play the harp. And the thing is, David is there just doing his job. He's playing the harp, right, you know, playing the harp. And, you know, Saul is just sitting there with a dagger in his hand, probably like, oh, that sounds good. And then suddenly, you know, he throws a javelin at him. And it happens twice. So imagine you just playing, and then you see all of a sudden, you just, whoa. Right, right. And then the thing said, it, the Bible says that it's stuck to the wall in one of them, that he threw it so hard, it penetrated the wall. And his whole idea was that I'm going to pin David to the wall with this thing, right? So this is where the pressure begins. He just playing music. And you know what? The Bible says here that David avoided out of his presence twice. So, I mean, David, just quick on his feet, right? <laughs> Let's go to one chapter over, chapter 19. And look at verse 9, chapter 19. The Bible says, And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, and he, and as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. So there it is again. We talked about the buildup of this pressure. David here has been hired to play the music. Really, Saul is his boss. So he comes to work every day, and guess what? His boss literally wants to kill him. You know how people say, man, I messed up on this project. You know, my boss wanted to kill me. They're not talking literally. They just talk about he's angry. No, David boss literally wanted to kill him. So here it is again where he's playing the harp another day, and he's watching Saul, and Saul is just sitting back. He has a javelin in his hand. You know, I'm pretty sure he's like, what you going to do with that javelin? Why you got the javelin in your hand? And what is it again? <laughs> playing the harp, and then, yeah, you know, he wants to pin him to the wall with the javelin. Imagine your boss calls you in the office, and he's talking to you, look, and then just casts a javelin at you. But we're talking about the buildup of this pressure, of this stress, where David just says, I cannot take any more, right? Uh, in the same chapter, what do we leave off on? Uh, verse 11. Saul also, so after he sent, uh, after he threw a javelin and David escaped, in the same chapter it says, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. So you talked about the buildup of this stress and this pressure. Not only is he casting javelins with you when you go to work, but then he's sending a watch to your house as well. So, I mean, he's, he sets up a watch of men to just sit outside David's house. They're just staking out his house to see when he's going to be rising up, laying down. And then his wife tells him, listen, you need to get out of here. If you're here by tomorrow morning, you're going to die. So she let him out the window and everything. But look at this. You talk about the buildup of the stress and the pressure. Look how much pressure Saul was putting on him. He sent men to his house. Like, it, literally, while you're sleeping, men are outside your house, watching your house. And look at verse 15. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. So wait a minute. In verse 14, it speaks about how the messengers came back to Saul, it said, and when Saul sent messengers to take David, she, talking about his wife, Michael, said he is sick. That's what she told the messengers. The messengers go to uh, Saul and tell him, hey, David's sick. And he says, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. Basically, I don't care if he's sick. Leave him right there in the bed. Pick him up in his bed. Bring him here in front of me, and I'm going to slay him right here. I mean, even if David was sick, I mean, that's really cruel, right? The man is on his sick bed. And he's saying, you don't even have to get him up. You don't have to move him. Leave him right there in the bed. Bring him right here, and I'm going to kill him right here in front of me. Right. Talk about the pressure is on, right? And uh, look at, uh, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 23. 
First Samuel chapter 23, the Bible says in verse 14, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds and remained in the mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. So look at this. Every day you got somebody trying to kill you. Can you imagine every day you wake up just knowing that somebody has it out for you? Every single day. We're talking about the buildup of this stress. Every day Saul sought him. It said, and David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Right? Look at uh, verse 24, same chapter. It says, and they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain of the south of Jeshimon. Saul also and his men went to seek him, and they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called that place Selah Hamalakoth. So notice that David is on a run and he gets to this mountain in Ziph. And what happens is he's on one side of the mountain. Saul also is at that same side of the mountain. David is trying to run. And Saul is coming the other way. They're basically playing around and around the mountain we go. One is on the other side. The other is on the other side. He's trying to get away. And finally, Saul and his men compass him about. They finally got David checkmate. As soon as uh, Saul is about to kill him, he finally has him. A messenger comes to Saul and say, hey, the Philistines invaded the land. And he got to basically abort the mission. Like, uh, he has David right here. Finally got him. Got him in camp. And then he finally has to blow off the mission because the Philistines have come and invaded the land. You're talking about God's timing, right? right. I mean, that had to be God's timing that the Philistines invaded the land at the, at the very same time that David is checkmate. That has to be the timing of God. And that has to be one of those things where you just praise God and say, God, I, I know that you're looking out for me. I thank you for protecting me. I like to say this prayer from danger seen and unseen. That was a danger that was seen, and guess what? God delivered him out of that. If you look at, um, look at chapter 24, this is interesting. So uh, he's chasing, he's throwing javelins, he's showing up at his house. He wants him to, if he was really sick, bring him here in this bed so I can slay him. He's chasing him in the wilderness. He finally gets this close to him. He has to abort the mission, but not only that, we have to understand that the buildup of David's stress is the fact also that it's not just Saul who is pursuing David. This is the thing about it. When you read this story, it's easy to just zone in on Saul and say Saul is chasing David. No, David has thousands of people who are chasing him. Look at uh, chapter 24, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 choice men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. Notice that. That is not just Saul. Verse 2 said, Saul took 3,000 chosen men. It's not just David being chased by Saul only. You literally have thousands of people who are after your life. Right. Right. Think about that. Men sleeping outside your house. You go to work. He wants to kill you every day. He's, he's casting javelins. And then you go home from work. Guess what? You got thousands of people who are after you. You know, in Psalm chapter 3, verse 6, you don't have to tell, uh, turn there. He says, I would not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. This is, he's not just saying this and just saying, no, he literally had thousands of people that are after his life. And he's saying, I will not be afraid. We're talking about the buildup of the stress 
that comes upon David. Let's turn back to chapter 27. He finally gets to chapter 27, and in, verse, in chapter 26, I'll just sum it up, Saul encloses on him again. This time, Saul is asleep. He has his spear and his water near his head, and, and David could have killed him, but he didn't. He goes afar off and he yells to him and tells him, basically, you know, I could have killed you. I chose not to touch the Lord's anointed. But in chapter 27 is when he just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Chapter 27, verse 1, he says, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. You don't have to turn there. But in chapter 20, 1 Samuel chapter 20, I thought about something. Verse 3, David told Jonathan, he says, And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly know that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he said, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. He told Jonathan, Your father is trying to kill me. And know this, as surely as the Lord liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Talking about stress, knowing that whenever you out, guess what? My life can be taken away just like that. Because men, thousands of men, not just Saul, is after my life. So in chapter 27, he said, there's nothing better for me than to go into the land of the Philistines. You know, you look at David, he's basically saying the best way for me to relieve my pressure, the best way for me to get rid of my problems, the best way for me to get rid of this stress, to get rid of Saul, is for me to just go into this worldly place called the Philistines. And the question is, is that always the best thing for you to do, to run away from the stressful situations? And you know, by human nature, because nobody likes to be stressed out, nobody just go around looking for problems, you will always look for a way to bring an end to your problems. And that's what David wanted. He wanted a way to end his problems, a way to end his stress. And what he decided to do is go into this worldly place called the Philistines, right? But the thing is, who does, who does David get this counsel from? Who tells David to go into the land of the Philistines? Well, look at verse 1. The Bible says, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Isn't it funny how the heart can just work up situations and circumstances, you know, that, that may not even be there? You know, the Lord already said that he was going to be king. He knew that. So are you really going to perish one day by the hand of Saul? But look what the heart can do. It can work up situations, uh, create situations that's not even there. And you know what? The heart is deceptive, right? right. So this is where he gets his counsel from. He gets his counsel to go into the land of the Philistines, not from God, but he gets it from his heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, you don't have to turn there. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. But notice who David is taking counsel from, his heart. So our first point that we can get when it comes to the pressure, when the pressure is on you, when, when you're feeling stressed out, number one, what we can uh, gather from the text here is number one, do not take counsel from the heart. Do not take counsel from the heart. And usually when people are under stress, when they're stressed out, when they're under pressure, they usually take advice from other people, don't they? They usually take advice from their own heart, don't they? And what do people say? Just follow your heart. Whatever your heart is leading you to do. And then they, they put God in the midst of their heart. Let God lead your heart. <laughs> Wait, uh, let God lead my heart. Well, which one is it? You know, because if God is going to lead me, then he's going to lead me. I can't have my heart in this situation as well. But people normally say, well, just follow your heart. However your heart leading you, you know what? Go ahead and trust your heart during this situation. And that's what David was doing. He was trusting his heart, and his heart, guess what? Led him into a worldly place. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So when under pressure, here's the thing. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. And then he said above all things, but then he also said it's desperately wicked. So under pressure, why when I'm stressed out do I want to seek something that's, uh, that is deceitful, which is my heart? Why do I want to look 
for counsel from something that's desperately wicked? Why do I want to go to something and get my counsel from something that I, that, that's going to deceive me and lead me to the wrong place? My heart should not be the place where I go in time of stress to get counsel. I don't want to go to the heart because it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? So that's what people do. Follow your heart. Well, you're following something that's wicked. You're following something that's going to deceive you in the end. And how did David end up? How did his heart lead him? Into the land of the Philistines. And notice what David says in, in verse 1 again, chapter 27. And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. We're going to zone in on this part here. There is nothing better for me. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. I had to really just, really that is the main thing that stuck out to me in this verse. There is nothing better for me. There is no hope for me. There is no way of this turning around for my good. Basically, David is at his wit's end. David is saying, I have gathered, I have, excuse me, I have put up all with all that I can take from Saul. I have dealt with all the stress that I can take, all the pressure that I can deal with. He's basically at his wit's end. He's basically saying, this is not going to get any better. He's saying, there is nothing better for me. And 100% of the time, when you hear people say this type of things right here, this type of rhetoric, there is nothing better for me, that's a dangerous place to be. That's a dangerous place to be when someone say, there is no other options. There, there, there is not going to get better. Here it is. When a person says something like that 100% of the time, they're going to make the worst decisions. They're going to make bad decisions. And if you don't believe me, just look at the text. There's nothing else better for me. Well, where did he go? To the land of the Philistines. So you know what? Here it is. People often, when I say that, you know, they say these type of things. There's nothing better for me. They usually make the worst decisions. That's just like, you know, a, a man who's trying to work and make an honest living, right, where he's just trying to make ends meet. And guess what? Things may not be panning out. You, he may still be coming up short uh, at the end of the month. It seemed like he got more month than money, you know. So guess what? He just, at a point in his life where he just say, you know what, Th there's nothing more that I can do. And usually when somebody get like that, they make the bad decisions. And what do they do? They go get a little side hustle. They may sell drugs. Some people, when they say things like this, they go off and rob people. They end up murdering people. Why? Because they say, there is nothing better for me. They say, it's not going to get any better for me. So I need to just go ahead and search this other way. What about people, you know, in marriages, right, where I didn't put up with all I can in this marriage. You know, we, we've been trying to work it, and, and it's not working out. There is nothing better for me. I can't see this marriage getting better. And what do they do? They end up divorcing. Anytime you get to this point where you're saying things like this, guarantee that it is not going to pan out well. What, what do people say? Man, there's nothing else for me. I can't see my situation getting better. Hand me that bottle of liquor. Hand me those drugs and so why? Because they don't believe that things will turn around. They don't believe that there is a better way. But guess what? There is always a bright and shining day that is coming. The Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Guess what? That stress may endure for a night. That pressure may endure for a night. It may endure and that night may be long. That night may be a month. That night may be a year or so, but guarantee that it is going to come to an end. It's going to turn around. There's always something better. Psalm chapter 50, verse 14 through 15. You don't have to turn there. The Bible says, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the most high. And you know what? During the time of stress, how about that? Look at what God has done. There's always something to be thankful for. When I look around and I just seem like, man, you know, this is not going right. Salvation. Yeah, say no more. Salvation is good enough. The fact that when I die, I will lift up my eyes in heaven and not in hell. That is good enough. Right. Nothing compares to this in this world. Nothing in this world compares to being saved. Amen. So you know what? He says, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the most high and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver and thou shalt glorify me. The Lord said, if you call upon me, Guess what? I will deliver, and you're going to glorify me when I turn it around for you. 
So praise God, there is a better day. There is a time where this will turn around. Don't be like David who says there is nothing better for me. Yes, it is. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. How about this? How about Saul? Saul was under pressure. Let's turn to chapter um, 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Saul is under pressure. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 5, it says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people, notice his word, were, were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks, and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered, were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and, the, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplications unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. So what is Saul's pressure here? Well, if you call on to verse 5, it said, these are the Philistines that gathered against Saul, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, People as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude, basically innumerable people, showed up just one day ready to fight. <laughs> just wake up in the morning like, whoa, I didn't expect this this morning. Yeah, that will put some pressure on you, right? If you caught on to verse 6, guess what? The people of Israel are afraid. They're distressed. Then not only that, they go hide in themselves. And then in verse 7, the people who are following Saul, they really don't want to be there. It said they followed him trembling. So that doesn't help. The people you got, they looking hard, but inwardly they, they're shaking. They don't want to be there. Yeah, that can put a lot of stress on you, right? That you got this army who wants to kill you and take you out, and the people who are supposed to be fighting with you, guess what? They don't even want to be there. Some are going over the other side of Jordan. And what does he do? In a time of his stress, well, guess what he does? He disobeys the word of God. The word of God that came through Samuel was for him to tarry seven days, and Samuel would come and make a sacrifice. Saul, in the midst of his stress, decides to go ahead and just disobey the word of the Lord, disobey the commandment of the Lord, and he goes off and makes this sacrifice himself. So the secondly, uh, second point that we can get from when it comes to the, the fact of when the pressure is on is when the pressure is on, continue to do what's right. Amen. Continue to do what's right. Yeah. And the thing is, what Saul said in verse, um, in verse 12, he said at the end of verse 12, I forced myself therefore. I, because you didn't show up, Samuel, when, when you were supposed to come, I, I forced myself to do this. And he's basically saying, what other choice did I have? Well, you know what's interesting? God knows everything, right? God knew that he would be in this battle. He knew that people would show up at Saul's footstep. But here's how you know that God was just still on time. Because the Bible said as soon as he made the sacrifice, Samuel showed up. So if he would have just waited, guess what? He would have made it through. Samuel would have came. And that's normally what happens in the time of distress, in the time of pressure. You move too soon, too soon, too early. And guess what? As soon as you give up, guess what? That could be the time when God was about to turn something around for you. Right? And that's what it was with Saul. He just moved too early. And what we get from Saul is that regardless of 
the times where you may be under pressure, the best thing to do is to continue to do right. Continue to keep the word of the Lord. Because the word of the Lord to Saul was that Samuel is going to make the sacrifice. Don't make the sacrifice. Samuel is going to do that. Well, yeah, he took a long time. Yeah, he didn't come during the time that he's supposed to come. But in spite of that, still do right. Let's go to um, 1 Samuel chapter 28. Saul is under stress again. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 5 through 7. The Bible says, And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. So the pressure is on Saul. Why? Because the Philistines are gathered again to fight against him. And, and guess what? Here's the biggest pressure. The Lord is not answering me. The Lord is not talking to me, neither by Urim, nor by dreams, nor by prophets. The Lord has cut off all communication with me. And, and what does he do in a time of pressure? Guess what? He disobeys again, and he goes out and seeks a familiar spirit. Here it is. In times of pressure, just do what's right. Here's, here it is. Leviticus 19, chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So guess what? Even when the Lord is not talking to uh, Saul, guess what? You can still walk in the last thing that he commanded you. And here's what he commanded you, Saul, concerning this. Not to regard them that have familiar spirits. You know, I know in the, in the scripture here, you know, his thing is, well, God's not talking to me. What am I supposed to do? The Philistines are, are, are here. They're here to fight. What shall I do? Walk in the last thing that the Lord told you to. You know, and it's just like how people are like, well, I don't know what the Lord want me to do. You know, I'm praying about this situation. Listen, you know, most people may not accept this, but there are some things that you don't have to pray for. That's just clearly written in the word of God. I don't have to pray about whether I should go out and preach the gospel to someone. It's just there in the text. I don't have to pray about, well, should I discipline my kid or not? No, it's right there in the text. So even if I can't really get a clear answer, man, what does God want me to do? You know what? Let me go to the scripture. This is what God would have me to do. So even if Saul did not get a clear answer from the Lord, here it is. Saul, walk in the last thing. Continue to do right even if God is cutting off communication with you. And you know what? That's the thing we can feel in times of stress that guess what? God is not hearing me. God is not answering me. I know I felt like that plenty of times. It's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly praying. I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm trying to provide. I'm trying to be a great husband. You know what? It seems like it's not panning out. What, what is going on? Well, here it is. There are times where you ought to do a self-observation. Let me see if there be any sin in me. Let me see if there be any wicked way in me. Let me observe myself. And if I can't find any type of sin uh, in my life, guess what? You know what? How about I just work in the, uh, walk in the word of God and guess what? It's going to pan out for me because I'm doing what the Lord would have me to do, even in the time of stress. So don't be like Saul and just disregard the word of God and just go off and, and do what you want. In times of stress, do what's right. You know, and really, <clears throat> I believe, you know, it's just my own opinion. I think, although the Lord wasn't talking to him, if you go to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, I think Saul would have actually still made it through this battle. If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 10, although the Lord didn't speak with him because of his disobedience, if he did not seek the familiar spirit, this woman, I think he would have still made it through this battle, he would have still lived. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Notice this, the Bible says in verse 13, So Saul died of his, for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So wait a minute, why did God just kill him? Because he inquired of that familiar spirit. So what if he didn't, you know, seek that familiar spirit? It, it, would God, it, possibly God, because there's nothing to offer the Lord, God, in spite of his disobedience, would have probably been merciful to Saul 
And you know what? And still, although he's been disobedient, although I'm not talking to Saul right now, still would have delivered him. But the fact that he just did this, this was just <laughs> the, the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. And, and this did it for Saul concerning the Lord. The Lord killed him after this. It said, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and endured not of the Lord, excuse me, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. And somebody could say, well, that's a contradiction because he did inquire of the Lord. He did ask the Lord. But the Bible says that the Lord was not answering him. So what was he supposed to do? Walk in the last thing that he heard, which was to not regard them that have familiar spirits. So you know what? Although the Lord is, did not speak with him, he did not inquire of the Lord concerning the word of God, not to regard them. And that was the thing that the Lord just said, you know what? You're done. Put a fork in his guy. He's done. I'm going to kill him. And literally the next chapter or next two chapters, Saul and his sons all died. Let's look at Jeroboam. Uh, let's look at 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam is stressed out. <clears throat> his, his stress is really funny to me. Look at uh, verse 26, First Kings chapter 12, verse 26. It says, and Jeroboam said in his heart, there it is again, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Look how the heart is just working up stuff. Man, they're going to kill me. They're going to leave here. They're going to go back and live up under the reign of Rehoboam. The heart can just work up matters that's not even true. Right. <laughs> just jump to conclusions. Yeah. It said he said in his heart, and I'm not going to go... Uh, to the beginning where the Lord called Jeroboam, but he already promised Jeroboam that if he obeyed, guess what? He was going to sit on the throne, you know what, and, and he was going to have peace in his days. The Lord would allow his seed to sit up there. He was going to make his, his reign prosperous if he just obeyed. So why is his heart telling him that he's not going to be king anymore? People are going to kill him. Well, it's because he's getting counsel from his heart. And notice what uh, his pressure is. What is his pressure? That people are going to leave me. People are going to go back to Jerusalem. He's afraid that when it comes to the Passover and the other sacrifices, that people are going to go to Jerusalem. And once they go there for the sacrifice, they're going to stay there. They're going to want to live there. So he's afraid pretty much of just losing membership. That's what he's afraid of. And look at verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel. From who, I wonder? It doesn't even say it. I believe his heart. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. He's telling the people this. It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Hey, it's too much pressure. Don't, don't go. Don't go to Jerusalem. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. Look what he did. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in, in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even in Dan, <clears throat> unto Dan, excuse me. So his thing is that, you know what, he's worried about losing membership. He's worried about, you know what, I, these people are going to go to Jerusalem and stay there. Well, here it is. What should he do in times of pressure? Do what's right. Do what's right. Stick with the word of God. You know, this kind of reminds me of, you know, many like-minded churches of ours. I'm sure there's slow growth, right? There's slow growth. You just don't see thousands just packing these churches, right? There's a slow growth, right? But the thing is, I'm sure it's easy to look down the street and guess what? See a church that is just having many multitudes just run in there, right, every Sunday. And I'm sure there is a pressure to say, man, why can't my church be like that? Why can't I do that? You know what? Maybe I should go ahead and change my sermon, change the Bibles, you know, change the, the atmosphere in the church and everything like that. Maybe I should do that. And you know what? Then I could start attracting people in here. Well, that's Jeroboam's thing. He's thinking about how can he keep people? How can he keep people from going to Jerusalem? So what did he do? He designed this fake church, this, this replica of what's going on 
in Jerusalem and basically telling them it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Just, just stay here. Here are your gods, uh, uh, Dan and, and Bethel. Here are your gods. He creates some, some golden calves, right? But don't fall into that pressure. As a church, we shouldn't, right? We should just do what? Do things the God's way. Do things God's way and, and continue to do right. Build the house, build the house of God the way he want us to build it. Jesus says, and I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So how about this? When it comes to building the church, just do it God's way. Just get out there, preach the gospel, get people baptized, bring them in, teach them doctrine, and you know what? That is going to build the church, and we just keep doing it over and over. But we don't have to have the pressure on us like Jeroboam to strike up this false church, this uh, replica of what's going on in Jerusalem. Just do right when it comes to stress. How about Moses under pressure? I'm almost done here. Moses under pressure. Let's go to Numbers chapter 11. We're going to actually look at uh, Moses and Elijah. Numbers chapter 11. Look at verse 10. The Bible says, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father bear the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone. Notice this, because it is too heavy for me. Well, what's the issue here? They're, they're complaining over the fact that they want flesh, they want food. They're comparing their situation back to what they had in Egypt. And basically, they are stressed out, and they're depressed with Moses. And Moses is depressed with them because they're constantly coming to him with issue after issue. And you know what? The thing is, what we're seeing here is that people of God, men of God, and, and I can go through many more women of God, you know what, who did great things for God, but guess what, had stressful times. And we seen with Moses, Elijah, many people, saved people who did great things for God. He brought multitudes out of Egypt. Uh, uh, Elijah did great things on, on Mount Carmel, but guess what, men of God, people of God who still had times of stress. And you know, there's this narrative, or so I guess people think that saved people Godly put people, children of God, just don't have any stress. Like everything is just sunshine and, and we don't have any rainy days. Like we don't go through any trials or tribulations. I don't know where, the, where people get that from. But you know what? It's, it's pretty much that when you start doing things for God, guess what? That's when the trials and tribulations turn up. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's not the fact that, listen, oh, it's just you get saved and, and you just live sky high and there's nothing going on. No. When you get saved, guess what? You will have issues. And we see in this with uh, Moses that, listen, he did great things. He parted the Red Sea, brought multitudes out of Egypt. And guess what? He still has a time in his life where he is depressed. So the third point here is when under, uh, when under stress, when under pressure, here it is. Don't look to bring life to an end. Don't look to bring life to an end. Notice verse 15. Verse 14, he said, it's too heavy for me. It's too much pressure. It's depressing. Notice verse 15, and if thou deal thus with me, kill me. I pray thee out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. He's basically saying, Lord, just kill me. And when we're under pressure, guess what? Don't look to bring life to an end. You know, that's just like what David said. There's nothing better for me. There's nothing better for me. And like I said, when people start talking like this, you better listen up closely. Because that's normally how suicidal people get. There's, there's nothing more for me. I, I can't see myself living anymore. Listen, this is the same thing that Moses said. It's too heavy for me. David said, there's nothing better for me. Many people, even saved people, can start talking like this and look to bring life to an end. 
Let's look at Elijah. And keep your finger here in Numbers because we're going to tie something back in between Elijah and Moses. But 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 4, Elijah is depressed. He has pressure on him. Notice what he says in verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested, notice this, he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Whoa, that, doesn't that sound familiar? There's nothing better. It's too heavy for me. He said, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Listen, in times of distress, don't look to bring life to an end. And we see this great man of God who is just wishing to die. Ministry has gotten too tough for them that they want to quit, that they just saying, Lord, just please take my life. Moses got false prophets in the congregation. Uh, uh, Dathan and Abiram, those guys raising up against him. People are, are gathering against Aaron. They're getting him to make false uh, gods and everything like that. These are great people of God, but just asking to die. Stress will get you to the point where you just say, I don't want to live anymore. I can't take it anymore. Elijah said, it is enough. He said, I, I can't take this no more. And, and what's his stress? That tomorrow you're going to die. Tomorrow you're going to die. Jezebel said, you're going to be like one of the prophets that you slain. Those prophets you slain, you're going to be like one of them by this time tomorrow. It said he went for his life. We use the term he ran for his life. He put the burners on and started running. <laughs> But he got to the point, he ran and ran until a point where he just said, Lord, it's enough. Take my life. Take my life. He wants to end his life, and he did great things. Then he just, one chapter back, the, the battle on Mount Carmel with the false prophets of Baal, right? But he's at a point in his life where he's depressed. And as I mentioned, people have this understanding about saved people, about children of God, that we don't go through anything. That you just get saved and, man, you're, everything going to go well for you now. No, it's not the case. But praise God. Here's something I noticed between Elijah and Moses. The thing is that God, in the midst of your depression, in the, in the midst of, of, of pressure, God will find a way to comfort you. Because look in, in that same chapter where he's wishing to die. Look at verse 18. He thinks he's alone. He thinks nobody's preaching like him. He thinks that he's been forsaken. Nobody's standing up. Verse 18 says, yet the Lord is telling him, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. That's encouraging, right? To know that, listen, I may be going through something, but there's other people with me. There is other people who go through the same thing, right? As I go through, go back. I told you, hold your finger there in Numbers chapter 11. Look at the comfort. I'm sure this was comforting for Moses. He said in verse 14 and 15 that it is too heavy. He wants to die. But look at verse 16. Look at the comfort. And the Lord said unto Moses, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. Here's the comfort. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. I mean, is that not some comfort, right? That the Lord says, you know what? I know you're stressed out. And you know the Lord didn't even chew him out. Suck it up, Moses. Come on. I, I choked. No, the Lord understands. And he said, you know what? Uh, no problem. He cried out unto the Lord. The Lord said, I, I got 70 men, 70 uh, capable, well-able men, and I'm going to put the burden, I'm going to let them share that burden with you. Right? And what are we supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to, you know, bear one another's burdens, each other's burdens? You know, and praise God for times in, 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 of stress, you know what, I can call a brother. 
you know, I, I can call a friend and, and a brother in Christ and say, man, you know, this is tough. And praise God for somebody who can come with a word of encouragement, a word of comfort and say, listen, man, the Lord got you. Let's go to this scripture. Let's read. And you know what? I need that remembrance, right? Yeah. Thank you for bringing that back to my heart. I need to hear that, right? And, you know, I believe the pastor was just speaking about this, how, you know, with Paul and, and his ministry, how he was in a time of where it was just stress and it was tight for him. And he said that the Lord comforted them by sending Titus. Right. Praise God that God in the midst of our struggles and depression, he got somebody who he can send. And you know what? Be a blessing to us. And you know what? If push comes to shove, if you don't have anybody to bear your burdens, praise God that we can cast our burdens upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in first, uh, first Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he care for you. Praise God that Jesus Christ wants to bear my burdens. He's asking to bear my burdens. He wants you to cast them upon him. Psalm 55, 22. The Bible says, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. The Lord said, cast thy burden upon the Lord. And that takes me to the last point here, that when we're under pressure, you know what? Cast thy burden upon the Lord. Amen. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. Let's go to 1 first, uh, first Samuel chapter 30. David here again, this, this man is under so much pressure all the time. You know, he has these 600 men that go with him. They're fighting and everything like that. But then notice how things turn around. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 5, the Bible says in verse 5, And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly, look at this word, distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David here has a problem because he was going to go to war, and the king and the, uh, the Philistines sent him back. And as he's coming back, he comes to his town, Ziklag, and he finds out that it has been invaded that the Amalekites came and invaded the land. They took their children, they took their, their, their wives, they took all their belongings, and guess what? Those men who David was fighting with, guess what they want to do now? They want to kill them. They're stressed out. And you know what? Here it is. It said David, it said was greatly distressed, right? And, and that's the stress that people want to stone you. They want to kill you. Now watch this. He got 600 men. 600 men surround you, want to kill you at one time. I mean, talking about stress. But I like at the end of this scripture, it said, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And sometimes that's what you have to do in the time of stress. You may not have somebody to call on, but you know what you have to do sometimes? Encourage yourself in the Lord. Get in the scripture. Get in the Psalms. Get in the, uh, the Proverbs. Get in the Gospels. Look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and encourage yourself in the Lord. Notice verse 7. It says, And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And, the, and Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And notice this. We're talking about in time of distress to cast your care upon the Lord, cast thy burden upon the Lord. Verse 8 says, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. And if you read the, re the rest of the story, he literally recovered all, just like the Lord said. But I like the fact that he cast his care. Lord, these men want to stone me. My wife is gone. My children are gone. Their families is gone. Lord, here it is. What shall I do? Shall I, shall I go up? Shall I fight? Here it is. He cast it on the Lord. And you know what? The Lord was entreated. The Lord said, okay, yeah, go, and you shall recover all. Last place we're going to turn, uh, 2 Kings chapter 19. It's the last place. 2 Kings chapter 19, look at verse 14. We have Hezekiah here. Hezekiah is under pressure too because he has the, the king of Assyria and his army who has showed up. And he sent his captain to do a lot of trash talking to, uh, to Hezekiah and, and to the people of Jerusalem. And he's telling them, listen, don't let Hezekiah deceive you saying that the Lord is going to deliver you, that we're not going to come in and take over this place. He's saying, listen, you need to look at what 
the previous armies did against us, how they were not able to stand against us. He started listing all these, uh, these armies and nations that they have destroyed, and he's telling the people of Jerusalem, you better use them for an example. You better look and see how they were not able to stand up against us. And basically he gets to just defiling, uh, excuse me, uh, blaspheming the Lord and defying the, the armies of God and, and the king and everything like that. And notice how Hezekiah takes this. Look at verse 14, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. It says, and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. I love this story right here. He get the message of basically all the blasphemies of the king of Assyria and his men, and he gets all this blasphemy in front of him, this issue, and he says, you know what, I'm going to come before the Lord. He spread it before the Lord, just lay it out on the table, and here's the thing, he came to the house of the Lord. And you know what, that's interesting because a lot of people in times of distress, you know it's sometimes the last place they want to go? Yeah. To the house of the Lord. Yeah, that's right, preacher. You talk to people, man, oh man, I'm going through it. Oh man, it's such a hard time. You know what, how about you come to church? Maybe, I don't know, maybe the pastor, the, the Lord's been working on the pastor's heart all week long. Maybe he got something for you this week. No, no, I don't, I don't want to do that, you know. I, I don't want to uh, hear anything about God right now. Well, you know what, that's the problem. That's the problem. That's probably where God wants you to be. No, it's not probably. That is where God wants you to be, in the house of God. And, and the thing is, you can't catch hold to the fact that, listen, part of the reason you stress is because you're not giving God the time that he deserves. Hezekiah, the Bible says, he went up into the house of the Lord and he spread it before the Lord. Just laid, Lord, here it is. And verse 15, we're talking about the fact to cast your burden upon the Lord. Verse 15, it says, and Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which had sent him to reproach the living God. And here it is, of a truth. He's acknowledging, hey, what, what the enemy is saying is true, Lord. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Praise God. You talk about casting your care upon the Lord, spreading it before the Lord. You know, and that's what we ought to do when we come to church. You know what? Spread it before the Lord throughout the week. Spread our, our depression and, and things that we're carrying, our burdens. Cast it before the Lord. The Lord said, my house should be a prayer, a uh, house of prayer for all nations. And, you know, I, I could touch on many women like, you know, um, you know, Hannah and Panina. Hannah wants a, a child, right? And where does she go? She goes to the house of the Lord. And you know what? The pressure was coming from Panina, who was basically mocking her for not having a child. But you know what? It's constantly through the scriptures where people are coming before the Lord in the house of the Lord and spreading the issue before God. And they're casting their burden upon the Lord. And you know what? We ought to do the same thing. Cast our burden upon the Lord. He said... As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'll actually quote 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 7. David said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Talk about in a time of, dis uh, of distress and pressure. What did he say? I, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. And you know, what's interesting, as I'm saying here, Cast your care upon the Lord. It's amazing how people just cast their cares on people who don't even care. The, the Lord is telling you, cast it upon me, for, for he careth. I care. But what do people want to do? Huh, get on Facebook. Oh, it's been a rough day. Get on YouTube. Hey, YouTube land. Hey, Facebook family. I'm going through. They're not your Facebook family. You don't even know it. They don't even know you. They're casting their cares on people who don't even care. And, and God is like in their face saying, give it, give it to me. 
I, I can turn it around. I can fix it. I can bless you. I can bring you out of miry clay. And what is saying, I don't want that. Let me cast it to, to, you know, my Facebook family. They're not your family. They don't know you. You haven't seen them in years, right? But what do they want to do? Cast it. Oh, I want to cast my care upon the therapist. The therapist don't care about you. I mean, it, the therapist is there for money. Take away money and see if the therapist will listen to you. No, they will not. <laughs> no, so cast your care upon someone who cares. The Lord says he careth for you. He is willing to allow you to cast thy burden upon him. And he said he will sustain thee. He said he would never suffer the righteous to be moved. So in times of pressure, in times of stress, as we go through this again, don't seek counsel from the heart. David and Saul constantly, you know, in times where they made bad decisions, well, I'm not going to say constantly, there was a time where they made their decisions based off their heart. Don't seek counsel from the heart when times of distress. Continue to do what's right in times of stress. Most people get tired of doing right. Um, I'm tired of just, you know, trying to do the right thing. Continue to do the right thing. Then don't look to bring life to an end. People get suicidal thoughts. People want to end life. You know what? Don't do such a thing. There is a brighter day coming. God is able to deliver thee. God is able to turn it around for thee. And then lastly, in times of distress, you know what? Cast thy burden. Don't cast it on, on the Facebook so-called family and on the YouTube family and, every, and getting on Twitter and Instagram and, and all those other platforms, casting all your care to people who don't care. And they don't want to hear it anyway. All they do is put an emoji up or something or a heart or the praying thing or so. They don't care. Cast it upon the Lord, for he careth for you. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for being a burden bearer, Father. Thank you for being a friend when we may be friendless, Father. And uh, we just uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for these examples of how we're to handle stress and, and pressure, Lord God. We pray that you would um, help us, Lord, to encourage ourselves in the Lord in time of distress, not to look for uh, worldly substitutes uh, such as drugs and alcohol when times of, of distress, but help us, Lord, to continue to do what's right. Help us to seek your face, seek your word, Lord, and hide your word in our heart, Lord, that we might not sin against you, Lord. Uh, bless us as we leave uh, this evening. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.